Okay, good afternoon. We're going to get started here and uh, the mic thing. Okay, good afternoon. We're going to get started here and uh, welcome. Glad to have you come look at some 3D projects from uh, myself at Cultural Heritage Imaging and Dan Dennehy and Robert Kassler. They'll introduce themselves when the time comes. I'm going to spend about five minutes here and just give you a little bit of background on photogrammetry, the technique that all of us uh, are using in these projects. And then um, we're going to just walk through our projects, and we're going to save about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So a little bit of background. Um, with photogrammetry, the goal is to collect surface shape and color of our subject using photographic image sequences. And we want to do that as uh, closely as possible to the real subject. And the idea in collecting a high quality image set is that we want to be able to uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively evaluate the result of the data. And we want to create data uh, that can be reused by others as well as processed in future generations. The technique that all of us are using here is independent of the software that you would use. Um, if you follow good practice, the data can be processed by lots of different software packages. Here's the basic setup. Uh, we have a camera with a wide angle lens and a monopod with a ball head on it and uh, some calibrated scale bars. And the scale bars allow us to add real world scale to our subject. Um, obviously, depending on the project, you may also need some lighting and, and other things, but this basic kit can get you pretty far in terms of shooting photogrammetry. The approach that um, we're taking is a rule-based approach where we're following a set of rules about how we collect the photo sets, and that will allow us to get both 3D and 2D outputs. I'm going to uh, show you some 2D outputs in, in my part and also allow the software to quantify the precision and the measurement uncertainty in the data. Uh, as I said, the approach is software independent, and therefore, if you take the same data set and process it in different packages and, and different points in time, you should be able to get um, the same model over and over again. One of the things that we're seeing out there, um, and I hate to say this, but particularly in archaeology, is uh, the advice that you just go take a lot of pictures and look, you can throw it in the software, it's so easy, you get a 3D model, isn't that great? And it's true, you will get a 3D model, um, and it might even look good, but it will have unknowable, unquantifiable error in it if you don't follow the rules. So this is something that we've been pushing with our organization is teaching people how to collect this data in a scientific way that can better support sort of research and measurement, repeatability, uh, and the archiving of the data. So I don't have time to walk through all of that here, but I want to uh, hit on one of the key things, which is how we shoot the image sequences using overlapping photos. Um, so primarily, we're doing a 2 thirds overlap, or 66% overlap of the photos which looks like that. Um, let me walk you through what a sequence would look like over a subject. So we have in the, that blob in the middle is kind of our area of interest, our artwork or inscriptions or whatever it is that we're looking at. Um, we have scale bars around it. And uh, we would think of the scale bars as part of our area of interest. And we would start taking photos where the field of view of the photo is 2 thirds off the end of the area that we care about. That's where we're going to get multiple look angles on the part that we do care about so that we can get the point in space exactly in the right place. So the second image, we're moving the camera one third of the field of view. And that gives us a 2 thirds overlap. And so now you can see in this area right here, we have uh, you know, two camera positions that are looking at that area. So when we take the third shot, now I have this strip right here where there are three camera positions looking at it. And with the fourth shot, I now have three uh, views of the camera on everything that I care about across the subject. So if I take that set, and let's say we shot that in landscape mode, and there, the order of the sequence is not important. It's the idea of getting good look angles from these different directions. So we'll call that uh, zero degrees. Now if I take the camera up a little higher and I turn it 90 degrees and I tilt it back down a little bit and I do the same thing, two thirds across, those are going to be narrower strips because of the three to two aspect ratio. Then I get another sequence across and I turn the camera 90 degrees the other way, down a little lower, tilt it up a little and I do that same thing again. Now I have nine look angles at every point on the surface that I care about. 
And if I do that, I know that I'm going to get that point exactly in the right place uh, on the actual surface and in my 3D model. Um, so uh, there are other rules that you need to follow. I'll just quickly say one of the key ones is you need to lock your camera down and not use autofocus and not change aperture and so forth. And obviously for more complex subjects, there's some other things to think about. But there are some basics for you. Um, there's some resources on our website. And uh, I'll also note that everybody here is using Agisoft PhotoScan Pro. But the way that we collect the images in these image sets could be processed in other software as well. There are a number of open source efforts. Um, our feeling at this point is that they're not quite there yet. but. Give it a few years, and I think there's going to be some great options that way. Um, my organization, Cultural Heritage Imaging, we're a nonprofit, and we do offer a training class in photogrammetry. And I want to point out that we have uh, some grant support from the NEH right now. Um, and so there's some free training offerings in 2017. If you're interested, go to our website. It's a pretty simple application process. And we're also going to be doing a two-day symposium at the Met in New York in March. That has more of a focus on RTI, but um, more broadly on computational photography. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Are you running here? If I'm making it. Nope. OK. Or my yeah. PowerPoint. Great. And uh, if anyone's interested in learning photogrammetry, um, I would highly recommend Carla's workshop. It's, uh, it was completely invaluable for me. Uh, it's four days of training, and I don't know how we would have been able to do this without Carla's help and Carla's contributions to our field and the cultural heritage community is just amazing. She's an amazing resource. And if you notice a lot of people giving her hugs out there, they've probably taken her class as well. So let me set this up a little bit. Um, so the imaging and visual resource approach to introducing photogrammetry at MoMA. Um, so we were drawn to photogrammetry as part of our imaging department's commitment to exploring new technology. So this was a self-directed effort. There was no other department that was asking us to do photogrammetry or 3D modeling. So uh, for us, why photogrammetry? Well, it uses equipment that's already found in the imaging department. So there's a low cost to the entry for 3D capture. Uh, the data generated when qu is quantifiable when done properly and potential for uh, multiple applications in-house and visitor experience. And there's also a lot of general interest already in, uh, in 3D. So for our research into photogrammetry, we decided to tackle three representative objects from our collection. Uh, on the left there, you see uh, Henri Matisse's Jeannette, which is a, a bronze bust. It's about uh, 36 inches tall. Uh, we did uh, Jackson Pollock's White Light from 1954, and Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City Project from 1934-35. Uh, starting with Jeannette Head, uh, Here's individual still images that we put together. We started with a turntable um, on the left doing 10 degree rotations. So 36 captures in the round at four circuits, so four different camera heights. Um, and then on the top right, we also did what's called a flat run, where we introduced those scale bars that Carla mentioned. Um, and then we also inverted the model to capture all the information around the rim, the base, and into the inclusion on the bottom. So uh, this is a view in Agisoft. Um, we created a dense cloud with 30 million points. Uh, the, uh, the blue rectangles are the position of the camera within space relative to the model. Um, and we're using Sketchfab to uh, show this model to various departments um, within MoMA. Um, especially for departments that don't really understand data and software like uh, that's as complicated as PhotoScan. So this is a great way to uh, share the model. It's uh, easy to view. It's very intuitive. It's web-based, uh, so there's no need to purchase or install extra software on someone's computer. 
Um, it's password protected, so you can make these models public or you can make them private and password protected so you can just share them among colleagues. Um, and then you can also virtually light the object in the three-dimensional space. So you can recreate studio lighting or you can create uh, raking light, uh, lots of options there. So on the downside, the model has to be lower resolution. So we're generally decimating the model uh, up to 90%, actually up to 99% sometimes, so that uh, this can go up to the web. Um, and it also has other limited features. So if this works correctly, I'm gonna click on here. Um, it's already loaded. Okay, here we go. So this is the model in Sketchfab. It was decimated down about 90%. Um, and then I relit it in Sketchfab so that uh, it's a little bit more dramatic, but it also gives nice uh, information about the surface texture. Um, and so with, with the full coverage of captures that uh, Carla teaches, uh, there's no holes. Uh, it's, fully, um, it's a fully completed model. We've got great texture. And again, there's a lot more texture in the actual um, photo scan model, and then you can also see into the inclusions on the base, which is really cool. And I just wanna highlight something here. Uh, if you look down in the bottom, let me turn off the lighting. You see down in the very bottom, Made in France. <laughs> it's a sticker from the original casting. You don't get to see that from your normal 2D publication quality image or even with the work on view. So. Uh, the next thing we tackled was uh, Pollock's white light. Uh, this was a lot easier for us to do. It took about 120 captures um, because it's you know, essentially two dimensional. We didn't capture the backside, but you could have done that. We just did the front and the sides. Um, Um, and here, again, you can see the scale bars. Uh, and this is purely for visualization. This is the kind of tool that we'll use to show curatorial education, uh, our web team, things like that, that aren't exactly data-driven. But you can you know, really zoom into the model, move around, see the sides of the canvas. So, a very cool tool for visualizing. Here's the positions of the cameras in space relative to the painting. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of uh, the dense cloud and all that, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share that information. Um, another way to render it to um, show surface texture. So, um, on the right-hand side, very detailed surface texture. You get rid of that color, you really see the painting in a different way. Uh, you can also pull out the, uh, pull away from the surface texture so that you're just seeing the thickest parts of the paint buildup on, on the surface, which is really cool when you're analyzing a, a painting like a Jackson Pollock. Um, another way to visualize is to use point light. Um, and again, this is all done in post. So you can create a point light source that's raking, and it's like going around a painting with a flashlight, um, which you could never actually do in the gallery. Um, last up is uh, Broadacre, which is a 12 by 12 foot model. Uh, Broadacre was an unrealized utopian society envisioned by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it represents a 10 kilometer square um, area that he wanted to build and uh, I think every family was supposed to get one acre um, square plot of land. Again, this is unrealized. Um, so photogrammetry was actually our best option for this. Uh, we wanted to get good uh, 2D captures with our normal camera, but due to the limitations and the height of our ceiling, you can see that we mounted a Hasselblad camera right to the ceiling, which is about 11 and a half foot tall shooting a 12 by 12 foot model, we end up using a 28 millimeter lens, which is, you know, introduces lots of distortions. And we also had very limited options for 
uh, lighting this. So um, with photogrammetry, once you have a 3D model, you can studio light it any way you would like, and then you can pull out ortho mosaics, so high resolution TIFF files from any angle with any lighting. So now we have infinite options for 2D images for publication in the web, um, as well as a full uh, rich data set of, of 3D information. So uh, this took 515 captures. We did it with a 5D Mark III and a 35 millimeter lens. The cloud point was 114 million points, uh, which I decimated down to 1.5 million for the Sketchfab viewer. Uh, capture time was two days, and the total computer processing time on the Mac was uh, five days with uh, a Mac Tower, 64 gigs of RAM. Here's an example of our capture process. Oops, nope. See if we can get this to work. So that's for you Benny Hill fans. <laughs> so here is uh, Broadacre in 3D in Sketchfab. How's the lighting look? So I simulated sort of a, a late afternoon light here so you can really see the surface textures. Um, but it really came out to be a, a wonderful model, a wonderful um, representation of it, and it's, instead of just having this one view, uh, we've got many, many views. Um, and also the viewer can kind of stand in the middle of this model. If you're viewing this in the gallery, you're six foot um, at any corner from being able to see the center of the work. So here you can actually come in, zoom into the center, and then get a, a bird's eye view. Um, and understand the model in a completely different way. Uh, here are the uh, positions of the camera in space, uh, measurements done in post, uh, so you can very accurately take uh, information uh, scale back out of that model now. Um, and I'm showing it in the shaded mode just so you can see the rulers. Uh, but the next steps for us really are to present this to the various departments listed here. Uh, of course, starting with the Board of Trustees, We've got four minutes to present to them next month, but they're the ones that have the funding to get these kinds of projects done. Um, but once we do that, we're gonna take this uh, around to these other departments um, who really know what their needs are, what they could do with this. So we'll present the full possibilities, but they'll probably end up coming up with the ideas of how it can be best used. But whether that's creating inverted packing materials for uh, storage, uh, recreating things that have been damaged and are too fragile to uh, do a plaster cast of or a mold, uh, creating models for uh, sight impaired visitors or uh, children to touch. Um, so uh, a lot of stuff going on, um, a lot of possibilities there. And then lastly, we, are, uh, we had a, a video crew come in and document the entire process of us uh, imaging for Broadacre, compiling that, interviewing us and curators. And we're going to put that up on the MoMA YouTube website and hopefully get some more public interest in that as well. So, thank you. Oh, you didn't change it? Okay, good. Yeah. That's the view I want. All right, good. Great. Working. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Danahy from Minneapolis Institute of Art, and I am 
going to uh, talk about photogrammetry at MIA, as we're affectionately known. And uh, it's basically a case study of uh, how we came about uh, doing photogrammetry at the museum. But before we uh, talk about the present I, and uh, where we might be going, I thought we could start at the beginning. Uh, when photography emerged onto the scene in the middle of the 19th century, it revolutionized the idea of, re of visual representation, and people quickly realized its documentary potential. One of the most popular and profitable uses of the new medium was photographing important and notable cultural heritage sites around the world. It wasn't easy then, and it's not easy now. And of course, today, we're going to do it much differently than Mr. Frith did, simply because we can. And by doing so, we have the potential to gain much more data and greatly enhance understanding of history and culture and the world. Yesterday, we saw a presentation by Brinker Ferguson that gives you an indication of some of the intensive efforts underway by many people, uh, including Carla, to rescan the world with the latest uh, tools and technology. Mm -hmm. For anyone who remembers the good old days of photography like I do, it was a time of slow incremental change where you might spend a career developing your skill at a technique and even use the same camera for about 20 years. Now we find ourselves surfing a massive wave of radical innovation with no end in sight. Um, at MIA, we're in the midst of a project that illustrates the difference between how we have traditionally documented our collection and the way we will likely do it in the future. It involves a collection of ritual Chinese bronze vessels that are considered to be of some importance. There is a major traveling exhibition planned and a two-volume catalog that we have been working on for a couple of years already. In order to thoroughly study the objects and share the information uh, with scholars around the world who would be contributing to essays to the catalog, a team of experts were brought in from China who took careful notes, made precise measurements, detailed scale drawings, and even used an ancient technique of capturing the inscriptions by pasting paper onto the pot and rubbing it with graphite to pull an exact impression of the incising. And of course, there was photography, a lot of it. Uh, I did the photography for the catalog. For the curator, the catalog is a very important outcome for this project, and he wanted the objects to be fully documented from multiple angles with very specific details. All the inscriptions, were, which were sometimes deep inside the, the pots, or behind a handle. And uh, it was about this time that we started playing around with photogrammetry and realized that this was the perfect way to capture this collection and essentially give anyone the option to closely examine the objects anywhere at any time. And maybe it even prevent the curator from coming back down and asking for that other detail that we didn't get the first time around. So um, it was around this time that we received, let's say, let's play this, right? Yeah. We received some support uh, from a, a generous uh, trustee. We had a whole hour with our board of directors, by the way, wow. Robert. And they were very interested. And one of them uh, <laughs> decided to invest in a turntable. They were very jazzed about what we were showing them. And um, so we, we bought this uh, turntable. Now, you, just, you don't necessarily need this kind of thing to do photogrammetry. In fact, your iPhone will do. But it allows us to work systematically and collect precise, repeatable data and walk away uh, and have a cup of coffee in the meantime. This is the uh, robot uh, from uh, Snap36 in Chicago. We're using a Canon uh, 5D camera on there. And now we've, uh, you see bronze color lights there, but we've actually moved to continuous light because you know when you're doing 500 captures, that strobe was going off all the time. There was a lot of stress on the system, and it was driving everybody crazy in the studio. Um, so uh, this is uh, one of the first captures we made. This is um, just a screen grab of me noodling, noodling around in Mesh Lab. Um, so you can see you get uh, you know, a 360 and more view of the object. Um, but um, it's still uh, it's a fairly good representation. It's certainly as close as any of us will ever get to actually holding the object in our hands. But it still looks a little more like an illustration than an actual photograph. Um, and it was around this time that uh, we were approached by a professor at the University of Minnesota, Gary Meyer, from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. And one of his students on his research team, Michael Tetzlav, was developing a texture mapping technique that projects images onto the 3D mesh that's created in PhotoScan. The result is an unstructured light field rendering that they call a lumograph, and it greatly enhances the detail and specular quality of the model. Here's another little video that Michael put together. And um, this is what uh, they call the unstructured lumograph. Uh, this is the mesh with texture, which is just what you straight thing you get out of photo scan. Back to the unstructured. It's a little more realistic. You see more shadow detail. 
Now this is just the input photos, and you're going to see a 360 spin of just the image that sticks together. You can see the reflective quality of the object here, right? Here's where you get out of photo scan. You don't see that. It's sort of some averaging of the photos on a point, so it, it averages and comes up. And maybe Carla can explain how that works behind the hood. Here again with the unstructured lumograph, because they're feeding the the uh, actual JPEG images in real time. You get a more realistic surface uh, texture on the object. So you especially see it here in this um, rider, uh, gold-plated rider and, and horse. On the, uh, it's not such a great uh, rendition here, but. Um, uh, photo scan is kind of, um, looks more like an illustration, is some sort of abstraction of it. The lumograph really gives you the reflective quality, the specularity that you don't uh, get otherwise. Um, they also developed a technique, and I'm going to press the video here, um, of, of photographing an object with a camera mounted flash so they can precisely calculate the direction of the light and create a real time playback in which the lighting can be dynamically altered. Gary and I, in fact, will be doing a workshop in Amsterdam in May. We just learned we're on the agenda there. Yeah. yeah so we're going to actually, with a camera and computer, do this there, and people can learn. Who wants to come it's a great conference, by the way. OK, the challenge with sharing this contact is being able to deliver the unstructured JPEG images over a network or WebGL in real time. It's a lot of data. Until we figure that out, we're working on alternate ways to share this with the public um, for the Chinese Bronze Exhibition, which opens in 2018. One option is to combine animation and photography in a video. And we, uh, we gave the photo scan camera positions to a student at the, at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And he rather quickly and easily created this movie, which um, would take a, quite a bit of production if you do this uh, like in tracking shots and video and trying to light. It would take you forever. But uh, so the potential angles of view are only limited by the number of camera positions. I'll do that again. Oh, no, I won't. Um, but, and then this is what Michael wrapped the, uh, the uh, lumograph images on top of that. And so we're thinking that we could do um, like custom flybys where a curator could do a voiceover pointing out specific details and important information about the pieces. Um, but for now, we're using what Carla calls the YouTube of 3D. Um, I didn't make that up. <laughs> And if an object in our collection has uh, a, a 3D model on Sketchfair, we link to it uh, from our collections page on the website. So uh, we only have a few things. We only have 16 models up there now, but we have about 50 or 60 captured uh, for the Chinese bronze project, but the processing takes a long time. Michael um, Tetzlaff, the, student, the PhD student from the U of M, worked with us all summer and helped us really refine our technique for capturing um, these models. But, uh, but this brings us to what some of the challenges are. It's a lot of data, right? I mean, like, so we used to take like five or six pictures of an image of an object. Now you're taking five or 600, right? And so you have to manage that. It uh, creates quite a pile of, of content, enormous processing time. On a standard desktop computer, it was taking us days, sometimes weeks to process the models, depending on you know, how many sides we were doing, if we were doing the bottom, the top, sometimes even the inside. So, um, this, I, I'm also from our trustee meeting, one of the trustees is a vice president of Thomson Reuters. We told them it was taking us a really long time. Well, they do a lot of data crunching. I don't know if you know this company. They work in the legal industry. And they sent over this super processor. So now we're doing network processing. It's like this eight core um, HP machine. And we're setting that up. And it's, a, a, and it's 10 times faster, at least. And I think we're going to even make it even better than what we were doing on our desktop machines. So that will help a lot. Um, and then you know there are many stages of, uh, in the process, and a lot of files get accumulated along the way. And we want to save as much as possible so we don't have to recreate that work. Of course, you don't want to wait days again for models to be made. So we save all the raw. We save all the, any of the uh, JPEGs that have been retouched and uh, all the process files that are left over from photo scans. We've developed a naming structure and a folder structure for this. Um, and we're using Bagot. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Bagot. It's, um, it's uh, um, a specification for archiving our session folders. It's a hierarchical packaging format used by the Library of Con Congress to support storage and network transfer. So a bag ca consists of a payload, which is any arbitrary content. It could be JPEGs, raw files, OBJs, whatever. You just throw them in the, into a file. And tags, which are metadata that documents the payload 
together with checksums. So it's a very efficient way of sharing this. And we've written scripts to populate most of the data. So there you see, this is basically what it is. The declaration says, what, what is Bagot? It's a checksum. You can use any number of different types of checksums that you want. Um, and then your metadata listing what's in the, um, in the folders, and then just your stuff. So we've written some bash scripts that uh, process this automatically. Um, and then um, we've, you know, you need robust metadata. So some of the fields are required. You know, this one, the nice thing about Bagot, it has some required fields. We populate those through the script. And then we're starting to add some MIA-specific uh, rights data and other things like that into the, um, into the files. So now to circle back to the beginning, uh, it's interesting to think about the kind of skills we need today to do our job compared to the skills that perhaps we were trained for. Um, so let's call it photography versus imaging. So photography be, tended to be more creative, right? A photographer was an artist, but now it takes someone more analytical to do this work or more technical. Um, of course, before a photographer considered camera angles and composition, there were a lot of subjective decision making. Now you need to optimize process steps. And it's no, there's no subjectives. Uh, you know, you're, you're taking all points of view. You don't have to decide if you're going to shoot it from here or from there. Um, you know, in photography, we had well-established workflows. Now it's, uh, we're developing these workflows, and everybody's trying to figure it out. Same with archiving standards. There's some real challenges with dealing with all this content. Photography was easily shared, even if it was boring and in books. Um, but uh, now you need specialized viewers to share this thing. And it, that's, that's one of the big challenges with doing this now. And then, of course, uh, you know, regular computers don't do it anymore. You need enterprise processing. Um, one required a photographer and a camera. Now it requires really true collaboration. It takes a team. It's like you, know, you need a production team. Not, not, you, one person can't really do this on scale, at scale, on their own. Which brings me to the acknowledgments. Because I have a great team at, at MIA especially Charles Walbridge, whose endless curiosity about technology has really driven this project. He's our lead collections photographer. But we also have people writing scripts, people doing metadata. And uh, Douglas is, uh, you may have seen him here at the conference, director of media and technology, is very supportive of the project. And, the, and now we have to work more closely with the other people in media and technology, the developers, who are going to help us get this content out uh, to the public. And of course, uh, Gary Meyer, and his research team at the University of Minnesota have been really generous with their knowledge. And it's a great collaboration. And we're very grateful for that. So I'm just going to leave you with the question of how do we best document our collections to advance understanding and scholarship in art history? There are many emerging technologies that allow us to see things in new ways and simply provide more information than you can get with conventional photographic image. Learning about and making use of these tools will certainly lead to new discoveries and ideas about the culture that we work to share and preserve. So, thank you. That was great. Thanks, both of you guys. Can we borrow that computer? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll call well, it the project that I'm about to show you, these guys are going to do some processing for us. <laughs> My data won't fit on a jump drive, even a really big one. So <laughs> that's the nature of these things. Okay. So I want to uh, talk about a project that my organization uh, has been working on. I think that's going to be better, which is applying this technique to a large scale uh, Diego Rivera mural that's in San Francisco. Um, the mural is known as Pan American Unity, and it's 22 feet tall by 74 feet long. So it's enormous. Um, it was painted in 1940 as part of a World's Fair on Treasure Island, and it had the original title of The Marriage of the Artistic Expression of the North and of the South on this Continent, but fortunately has become known as Pan American Unity. Uh, it has it's an enormous amount of space, so there are a lot of things going on in this mural, and there's a lot of iconography and, and so forth that's happening. Uh, this is the full-scale charcoal drawing that was done on site at the World's Fair. It was in an art and action building, and uh, so he did the full-scale charcoal drawing, and then it's a, it's a wet fresco uh, project where he had assistants that were paint, painting some of the less important areas and also applying the plaster wet plaster for him to paint on uh, every day. 
So when we approach this project, and, and you'll see from some of the photos in, in, in a minute, it's pretty tricky because this thing is kind of wedged into a small space. It uh, goes all the way to the ceiling. There's a railing right where you don't want it to be to shoot the bottom of it, and it goes right up to the uh, sides. So we had a three-person crew that spent four days on site, and that was after quite a bit of planning um, and rigging out this lifter. Um, we shot uh, close to 1,500 50 megapixel images for this, and the reason is, and you'll see this in a minute, the, the surface detail on this thing is very subtle, and so most of our projects we would not be shooting at this resolution, but because of the nature of this project, we really felt like we needed to go in uh, and shoot it that way. We actually shot the whole thing twice, once with a wide angle, 24 millimeter lens to help us get really good geometry, and then again with a 50 millimeter lens to uh, bring in the resolution to where we wanted it to be. Um, we had a number of goals of this project. One is that the mural, uh, which was painted on panels and has been moved twice, there's a plan to move it again. It's been where it is now for more than 50 years. And so we wanted to support the planning of that move and also conservation efforts to really understand the state of the mural and any uh, intervention that might need to be done to stabilize it before it was moved. Also, this, this mural is not that well known and not many people go to see it. It's kind of hidden on uh, the college campus in a way that's sort of hard to find. It has limited hours, so making it more accessible to people and allowing people to really dive in and look at the details of it was a goal as well. So here we are uh, on site with the, with the rigged out um, lifter. You can kind of get a feel for the scale of this mural. Um, I, I also have a... a <laughs> A time lapse because it's fun. Um, so yeah, that's what it looked like. We spent a lot of time going up and down uh, in the lifter, and you can see there that it's rigged where we're looking through the camera onto the laptop, and that's determining to make sure we get the right overlaps of the camera and stop the lifter uh, going up and down uh, to get the mural. So let me. Go to the next screen. So I have a couple of screenshots here that are just from the mural itself. It's not, even though it was painted flat on these panels, it didn't fit in the space. Um, and it had been in storage for about 20 years. So it was kind of wedged into the space. And um, in, in the panels were placed in this kind of quarter moon shape. So uh, these are just screenshots from the model. Uh, this is my camera array, 1,479 cameras. Yes, I know that's insane. Um, and then just sort of zoom in. The blue rectangles here represent the camera positions for, uh, for the project. So uh, here I am back to this slide. Oh, because I have another video here. So this is gonna show the level of detail uh, that we have for the surface. We've only been able to put together some uh, small detail areas at the high resolution. And you can see that we have in the 3D model the actual plaster surface. And you can see the hand of uh, Rivera's paintwork um, in the plaster surface on this mural. Um, these are a couple of historic photos of the plaster being applied and uh, you can see the charcoal drawing on the right here so that would get covered up in bits and pieces day by day uh, as this went along. It took him about eight months to paint the mural uh, and he did that in full view of the public in this art in action uh, building that was part of the World's Fair. Look at the hands here and you can just see that that they're just they're right there in the plaster and I was really surprised because I spent I've spent a lot of time looking at this mural and you don't see that when you're standing there because our eyes tend to follow the paint color and not really understand the surface underneath. So what I want to do is show you a couple of details from the mural. Um, I'm going to show you, there's this really cool little cat figure that I'm going to show you as an ortho mosaic and also a cigar store Indian. So I have this uh, loaded up in the background. Oh, whoops, it changed the view. Okay. So let me back out. So here's the, this is the whole thing. And on the computer we have, we can only build a medium dense cloud for the whole thing, which is 446 million points in a medium dense cloud, which means when we build this at the highest resolution, it'll have 16 times that many uh, data samples. Um, but even just from the medium, you can zoom in and kind of scroll around and, and, and look at some of the iconography and the details. And one of the things that we're going to be outputting from this is a very high resolution 2D image, and I'll talk about that 
uh, in a minute because that's something we know how to share right now on the web. Okay. I want to show you, um, there's a crack in the mural and, it, and we can see it, um, but there's some detail of it that's sort of hard to see. I was the only one crazy enough to do a live demo, so you just have to bear with me. Um, so you can, can you see the crack along here? Okay. So this is the dense cloud with color, and for those of you that don't work with 3D, a dense cloud is the points in space. It's an XYZ point in space uh, with a color associated with it. We can take the color off of it, and uh, if I, you may not be able to see that if I rotate it just right. Um, there we go. We've got the crack actually in the geometry, so that's not just the color. Uh, and then, then once you have a dense cloud, you can turn that into a mesh, the triangles that you're used to seeing. This is the solid model. Uh, the mesh is a solid, and so you can see it's really subtle. Um, but, but the point being that we at, one of the reasons that we chose to go this high resolution is because we wanted this level of detail to be able to examine the surface um, as historic documentation, but also to support the conservation um, efforts. And the last thing I'm going to show you in the live demo here is the Cigar Store Indian. I love this part of it. I love all of it. It was really, really fun to be able to hang out there and, and look at this thing. Although it's mostly looking at it on the laptop and not like looking at it five feet away from me. Those of you, all of you photography people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, I'll go back to full screen here. Okay, so if we zoom into the Indian here, um, this is so these details that I'm showing you, they've been rendered at the highest resolution. So we're looking at the high resolution model for these small areas. And um, one thing in PhotoScan, I can't adjust the lighting. I need to really pull this out into another um, tool to, to, to really bring out some of the details from the lighting. So here's the, the plaster surface again. And I'm kind of trying to show you along the, the hand here. Um, there's also an area, let me turn the color on. There's an, a patched area in his uh, chest right here that we can see really, really clearly in the model, except it's not showing up right there. See if I can get it, there we go. So, uh, so the point being tons of detail that I think supports an incredible level of, uh, of research of this material. Okay. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the resolution that we, that we chose uh, to go with here. According to the PhotoScan software, we were um, 0.162 millimeters per pixel is the sample density. That's about 38 samples per square millimeter, and that means we're gonna have over seven billion uh, points on the total area, which is about 145 square meters. And actually the point clouds you can move around even on not that beefy of computers. Once you create the mesh or the solid model, it's, uh, yeah, see ya. So <laughs> one of the things when we were planning this is that we were looking at what's the image resolution of our input images that we're gonna get to put into this. And our plan was to shoot it from five feet. According to PhotoScan, our average distance was five feet, two inches. So pretty good given how much those lifters move around. Um, and so uh, the the, you know, PPI was about, we were shooting for about 200, we got about 190 um, in the input images that's outside of the 3D environment. Um, I'm really just talking about resolution here. I've got some data on the precision uh, and the uncertainty data, but it's much more complicated to talk about that. So I think I'm gonna hold that and if people wanna talk about it, we can do it in the Q and A. Um, but one of the issues we faced is, is just as the other folks have said, you know, how are we going to share this? And you know, a key, a key output for us is a high-resolution 2D ortho mosaic. 
We'll probably do some detail areas in something like Sketchfab. And we're also looking at some of the viewers that are kind of coming online. There's one uh, coming out of the team in Pisa that wrote Mesh Lab and the RTI viewer. They're called the Visual Computing Lab. Uh, and that viewer is called the 3D Heritage Online Presenter. Uh, and so we're taking a look at that and talking to those guys about how that might be the right uh, a way for us to share it. Let me talk about ortho mosaics for a minute. So this is obviously a down -res version of an ortho mosaic, but I was able to build that area of the Cigar Store Indian. This is 12,288 pixels uh, high, so I'm getting about 175 PPI as a 2D. So why do a 2D from a 3D? The advantage is once I have things understood in 3D space, the software's figuring out exactly where the camera was, the pitch, yaw, roll of the camera and I can project points back out into space, I know exactly where they are in 3D space. So if I want to create a 2D image, I have all of that information to properly project it on a 2D plane with no pushing or pulling or stretching of the pixels. So I can get a very accurate 2D image, much more accurate than if I try to do overlapping images and do photo stitching, which is always going to stretch and pull and you're fighting, keeping the camera exactly parallel and so forth. So I think this is a potential um, way to get high resolution output for tricky uh, large scale objects uh, as 2D as the output. So let me dive into that a little bit more. Um, this is one of the input photos and you see this, this uh, lovely cat here. This is from one of the 50 megapixel images. Um, here's just the cat cropped out of the image photo. It's about 3,300 pixels across. Here's an ortho, uh, an ortho mosaic of the same area. So that's pulling from multiple photos onto the uh, onto the cat. Here's at pretty much full resolution, so just a little thousand pixel uh, cut from the input photo. And here's the similar area from the ortho mosaic. So I'm losing a little bit of quality here, but not much. So essentially I'm going to be able to get, you know, 145 square meters at 175 dpi as a 2D output, which is, um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of happy about that. <laughs> so. Uh, the other thing that we've looked at is how to share it for a different community, the research community. And one of the questions there that they're interested in is looking at what's called the Jornada lines, which is where the plaster um, is, uh, the wet plaster is applied next to the dry plaster for the next day's uh, work. So we know from this historic photo that there's a Jornada line along the hand here in the back of the leg for the cigar store Indian. So um, here is a screenshot. Uh, of that of that area of the hand, and then this is very very subtle in uh, this because I don't have a way to relight it. Um, but here we've drawn the line in where the Jornada line is, and here that is uh, back. And some of the Jornada lines are much easier to see than others. So uh, I want to acknowledge a few folks. This project was primarily funded by a group called the Friends of the Diego Rivera Murals. It, the mural lives in City College of San Francisco. They're the owner and steward of the mural. Uh, Will Minas is an unbelievable resource who knows everything there is to know about this mural. And also folks here on the panel, uh, <laughs> Mia's going to help us process the full resolution on their fancy big uh, server that Dan was just talking about. Yay! And uh, Robert also helped us figure out uh, some uh, color management approach. So um, I'm going to end with that. We have about... 10 minutes, we're right on time, woohoo. Uh, and so we want to just open it up to uh, questions. Speaker. Um, thank you all, that was amazing. Uh, my question is more for Robert and Carla, and Carla, you sort of touched upon this. Um, I'm wondering for conservators, um, and, and Robert, just to say, I love that you, you have all this data and then you're going to the different departments and saying, okay, we have this, here are some possible options, but basically, what can we do or what can we make that, you know, you can educate the public better, you can use it for your research, I think that's phenomenal. Um, and, but I'm curious with conservators, um, you know, tracking the rate of change over time, so for example, Carla, if you were to do the same type of imaging mm -hmm. of the mural in five years, which you know would be huge, mm -hmm. but, you know, would you see that crack get bigger? Um, and, you know, I know conservators like Dale are using RTI to track the rate of change on, like, Georgia O'Keeffe mm -hmm. museums, or, or paintings, and I guess I'm just curious if, Robert, your conservation lab is interested in this, and Carla, if you have any examples of conservators mm -hmm. really wanting to use this imaging technology to inform their practice. Right. So I'm going to summarize that for the audio. <laughs> 
But essentially, the question is about uh, tracking change over time or monitoring change. And I think there's a little bit of a question of using RTI versus photogrammetry to do that. There have been some efforts to do it with the reflectance transformation imaging. Um, I'll kind of answer that from my perspective and then uh, since I'm standing here and then let, uh, let Robert pop in. There is a lot of interest in using this technique for monitoring change like uh, wear for outdoor sites, you know, uh, weathering. Um, we have, uh, we've trained some people from USGS, in fact, that are interested in um, beach erosion on cliff faces. <coughs> in order to do that kind of work, you need a pretty high precision, uh, <coughs> low uncertainty model, and you also need a way to figure out uh, how to line up the new model that you, that you collect with the old one. So for something like this, that's a little bit easier. For something like beach erosion, it means you need some permanent things that you can kind of tie into with your model to do the comparison. But I think that's a great use of photogrammetry, and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, I think there, there have been some projects that have been done. I can't point to anything specifically, um, but that's certainly something that people that come to our training are very interested uh, in doing. And I think in this case, because this mural is going to get moved, there would be a desire to shoot it again after the move to see if anything changed or shifted or if that crack got bigger. Uh, so we believe that we have good baseline data that would support that kind of question. So Robert, sure. Um, so our conservation department actually did send someone to uh, the CHI training. Um, well, one of the things that we found with our conservation department, although they're, um, they're fairly good technically with cameras, um, really the expertise on capture and, and uh, the, the side of, of putting this data together um, is kind of photographer's realm. Computational imaging is, I see, kind of best done by the photographer, and then we move that data set to conservation so they can figure out how to use it best and whether or not the comparison models work well. Um, so that's sort of the, the division of labor I see, even though a lot of uh, conservation departments are doing a, a number of different types of imaging, um, but they're usually coming back to us, you know, asking for help with their camera systems and things like that. So if we could offload that work to the imaging department and then the data analysis and all that kind of stuff um, to the specialists. Uh, that's, that's the way I would see it working. But yeah, they are very interested in it. Yeah. And I would just add that the complexity of what it takes to capture the images is all over the place from you know, the subject. So there are really simple like rock art examples that you can shoot in 10 minutes and you don't need a really high skill set, particularly if they're outdoors and you don't have to think through the lighting. And then there's really much more complicated ones like some of the projects that we've been showing here. So there's a question in the back. I'm just wondering if it's practical to, to discuss or summarize some of the color management issues you have with, like if you're pulling TIFFs, 2D TIFFs that are gonna be used in, in normal uh, applications, how, could you, could you just briefly talk about some of the issues you've had? Sure, sure. Um, well, one of the issues with computational imaging is it's doing some things that we don't know exactly what it's doing at the moment. So one of the next projects um, that I want to do is actually uh, testing the color um, accuracy. So not only for the images that we've created for these models, but um, if you're really changing the ge geometry, at what point does that affect color that you're pulling back out. I, I think that there's not a simple one-to-one -one, um, input to output change or compression. Um, and I want to get in touch with the people at Agisoft and find out um, what they're doing for color management in the background of their engine. I don't, they might even be in an sRGB you know, display space or something like that. So yeah, that's to come. Yeah. Okay. But I would, just to add to that, and this is kind of related to the lumograph work that, that Dan was talking about. Um, so Photoscan, its primary purpose is to do the photogrammetry to figure out where the cameras were in space and how to project the points back out. And it does that extraordinarily well, and it just keeps getting better and better. The way that it makes its texture maps, and I believe you know Michael Tetzloff was the guy who was talking to about this. They could be doing a better job for some of the ortho mosaics and texture maps, but here's the thing we can export all the camera positions and we have the photos so we can use other software to do that. So we're not stuck with 
Photoscan uh, in terms of some of our outputs, we can do it in other ways. The other thing is Photoscan supports JPEGs, TIFFs, whatever. What we did for the mural is we did JPEGs of the 24 millimeter images because they were just to get good geometry. Then we just, and then we used 16-bit um, TIFFs that were better color managed for the, uh, the 50 millimeter shots. And then we dis after the project was all aligned and optimized, we disabled the 24 millimeter shots, so we were only using the 50 millimeter shots for our ortho mosaics and texture maps and any of those outputs. So you do have some controls over um, how to play with it, but I totally agree with Robert that there's stuff going on that we don't, you know, it's commercial software, we don't know what's going on completely. And yet, we have the data where we can do our own stuff with it. One thing I failed to mention too is that uh, uh, Gary and uh, the, the research team at the U of M are releasing their light field renderer right. as an open source application right. through cultural heritage imaging. So I don't know yeah. when. Well, they're they're releasing it right now on their site. There hasn't yeah. been a huge demand for it, but it's something yeah. we we're looking at possibly taking over from them. But I think the key point being that Photoscan allows us to export all of these things, including the camera positions and stuff that other tools can then use to render them in ways that we do know what they're doing. So that gives me, you know, again, back to that archive idea. If you collect high quality image sets that follow a good set of rules, there's all kinds of stuff we can do now and we'll continue to be able to do with them in the future. Chris, you had a, a question? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, these presentations were great. It's fantastic to see what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. Um, uh, photogrammetry is one way to get to the 3D object endpoint, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to know what was your decision process to <coughs> choose photogrammetry over a laser scanner, structured light scanner? Um, I know that they all have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, and what made you all decide that this was the way that you were going to go, and, what, and it was best for your purposes? I would say from, from the perspective of cultural heritage imaging, everything we do is image-based. We totally believe that uh, computational photography and image-based approaches are where it's at and where it's going. It's a huge area of research. Stuff's going to get better and better. And for us, it's about archiving the data because it's we know how to archive image sets and about transparency of what's happening and about the data being able to be used in multiple packages and you know into the future. Our concern about lasers in particular is they collect the data in a proprietary black box, and while you can spit it out in some formats that lots of people can use, you don't really have control or know exactly what's going on to that data inside. So that was a huge issue for us. Um, we've been doing photogrammetry and structured light. You know, Mark's been, Mark started doing laser scanning, our president, back in the late 80s, and structured light in the 90s, and then watching photogrammetry until we felt it was sort of ready to go, but I mean, our, our obviously our needs are different than an individual institution. So I'd love to hear what these guys' answer is. We had the cameras already, right? And all we needed was a five hundred dollar license, educational license, a photo scan, and you can get started. Um, and you know, I always wondered why, um, like the laser scanners, don't have better cameras in them. But I guess it's really not a demand because the people who are using the laser scanners, they just want the geometry. They're not necessarily looking for. Oh, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you hear them talk, yep. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that will happen yeah. then. Yeah. yeah, same with us. I put it in our slide. It's, it's we had the equipment in-house. Um, we knew people that were, were doing this really successfully. Uh, so it was a low cost. Um, and then uh, there was one more thing I was going to say about that. But Oh, well, I, I think we approached 360 spins as, you know, the first foray into showing three dimensions. And it's, you know, the same technology that if you go on a website and you look at a shoe and you kind of mouse it around, it just shows, you know, 12 different images, um, but it's not three-dimensional. You're just doing a slideshow, essentially, looking around it. Um, and that was sort of popular, um, and it seemed like a logical next step. If you're capturing, you know, every 10 degrees to do something like that, um, you just get more angles and put it into different software. You have a full 3D model. So it was just sort of a logical step for us and then a lot of other benefits for other departments for potential uses as well. I call that fancy stitching. Yeah. Fancy stitching. <laughs> There's no 3D underneath. And that can be fine. It depends yeah. on, it's, again, it's all purpose driven. What's your goal? Who's your audience? Why are you doing this? And my mantra is if you don't know why you're doing it, don't do it. 
Like, go figure it out so that you collect the data the way you need to support the thing you're trying to support. Yes, sir? Is there a role for the dam in any of this? Do you store source images or the bag or what, what metadata, all that? Uh, it's a great question. I think that's stuff that, that we're all wrestling with a little bit. I mean, our organization has some workflow tips that we give people. We work with a lot of different institutions, so partly we have to you know, fit in with what they're doing. I'd love to know what you guys are doing. We, we, we're thinking of, we, we don't want to store all those source files in the dam. But um, I know a PDF even now supports 3D, mm -hmm. so we could put a PDF um, of one of the objects, or an OBJ into the dam, and that's, uh, that's you know, could be shareable in time. Great. And I've got our two dam administrators sitting right over here, so uh, I don't want to say what we're going to do with them yet. <laughs> <laughs> I might get yelled at. Yeah. But I think, I mean, right now what we're doing is trying to figure out a good workflow and sort of file name, naming conventions, directory structure. We've spent some time thinking about, like, what are the intermediate files that you don't really need to save? Like, there's no reason to save the JPEGs and the TIFFs if you have the RAWs or DNGs, you know, uh, because you could always generate it, generate them if you need to. And um, also, our organization's been, I didn't, I didn't present it here, but looking at what's the metadata about the project that you should be collecting. And we have some tools uh, that we developed for RTI that we just got a small grant to add photogrammetry support to those tools. So watch this space in the next year. We're going to be bringing out some tools to help with that side of it. Carla, maybe you notice that museums are afraid to throw anything away. What's that? I know. <laughs> Have you even noticed that? I get it. Yeah. But that's why we want to advise you about which things you can safely throw away. Yes. Oh, well, that Celestial Horus, actually, that was captured in the gallery with a camera, uh, a flash-mounted camera, or camera-mounted flash. And um, um, so that was, that is about, you know, I don't know, four or five feet uh, square. So, and, and we've also, um, you know, we've done, uh, you know, simpler captures um, of, of full-size sculpture, too, but nothing... Um, you know, not not nothing for uh, nothing super high res. Yeah. We uh, recently did uh, several colossal marbles in our collection yeah. at the high, and yeah, there's only so much you can do with a big 500 pound marble. Yeah. But we had a had a guy do a, a track around, and then we just moved the array of cameras around uh -huh. it. Yeah. But the results have been not as smooth as we hoped. It's very good. It's yeah. Tell them to come take our training. Yeah. <laughs> it's likely to get easier and more automatic, too, I, I yeah. think. Yeah. I think, it, yeah, yeah, the software's getting it better will, and better. Yeah. But there's, there's still, regardless of how good the software gets, there's some just laws of physics and laws of optics involved in why you need to shoot things certain ways and why you need to lock down your settings in certain ways in order to get a really good, tight camera calibration. And at the end of the day, getting your points projected back out into space in the right place is all about the software having properly calibrated your camera and, and figured out your camera positions. And there are a lot of mistakes you can make in how you collect your data that prevent the software from doing that as well as it could. It will still produce a result, but a lot of the, the surface could be really bumpy in places and not clean like the, the fresco that I showed you. That usually means you either didn't get enough look angles, or you didn't lock down some of the settings and get a proper camera calibration. So there are reasons why when it doesn't look the way you think it should. Right. The same question was just going to be if I wanted to start a new project, say for 10 objects, what, what is a ballpark uh, estimate for cost? I wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah. It, you know, it's really going to depend on the subject matter and the level of detail that you need. And, you know, you, you, if you already have camera gear, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like a shill saying you should get training, but seriously, yeah. if you get training, then you're going to likely get a much better result like the kinds of things that were being shown here. But I should let these guys speak. I, I imagine eventually it's going to get to the point where like uh, a registrar will be able to do this. Um, an object comes into the collection. Instead of getting out the ruler, they're going to get out the scanner. And, and make a capture that uh, you know takes measurement data and, and a reference of the object. But we're not there yet. Yeah. In the meantime, get the training. One last question, Rob. Uh, so you said that um, 
There's still a lot of research going on as to the best ways to make this accessible to the public. Um, what should we as a community that is, you know, have great interest in this technology be doing uh, to promote this sort of work in the web architecture in general so that you can just put your web browser in a bottle and, and have it work rather than having to <laughs> use a video or a proprietary uh, rendering software? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, well, one thing is there are open source things out there. So the Lumograph stuff is open source. The uh, 3D Hop that I mentioned is open source. Um, there, so there are some of those kinds of alternatives that are at least transparent, even if they're not kind of working as well as we want. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. There are, 3D is obviously an area where there's a lot of demand and where things are, are going. Um, the huge, huge, huge input of cash from Google, Facebook, you name it, into VR is going to push, I think, for more 3D content. A lot of that content is sort of game quality content. So, I mean, it looks great, and the user has a great experience, but it may not meet that sort of scientific measurable requirement, and that's okay if that's your goal. So, I mean, I think part of what our organization would like to see out there, because we're more on the capture side, not you know on the viewing side, is that there are ways to help users that care to find the information about what they're looking at, what the resolution and, and precision and uncertainty and those kinds of things are about the data. Um, have holes been filled? Has somebody gone in by hand and just made this look good because they didn't have data there? Um, you know, how do we help people understand what they're looking at if they're trying to use it for you know, research, for example, um, is different than just, wow, I got to see this castle from medieval Slovenia, right? So I think we need to end it there. We're a couple minutes over time, but thank you all very much.